Hey, this is Grant Arthur with Grant's Rock Warehouse, and we have a special episode tonight. My co-host, as usual, is Todd Evans. You can see Todd on The Contrarians. You can see him on Date Rock Daydream Nation with Peter Kerr. He's everywhere. But tonight we have a special episode with Vanessa Briscoe Hay, who was the lead singer of Pylon, legendary Athens band. In fact, what I want to add is 1987, when R.E.M. was named the best, best band in the nation. <laughs> you know this quote, Vanessa. I know you know this quote. Bill Berry said that, no, R.E.M.'s not the best band. It's Pylon. And I can't argue <laughs> with that. Don't, don't get all that way. <laughs> but it's true we're talking 1987 and but bill barry was spot on so we have vanessa with pylon and more recently the pylon reenactment society so welcome vanessa it's great to have you on, on our show i appreciate it this is i don't want to be all geeky and everything but this is kind of a big moment for me oh. well and todd but todd kind of knows you already yeah. Well, yeah. we're all, all friends, right, Todd? <laughs> right. And, uh, right. Yeah. It's my but, it's my it's my pleasure to be here. Thank but you for what having I was gonna me. say, thank you. Oh God, I appreciate it. But the thing is, is that Todd already had the box set that came out recently, but the CD box set, the the record box set came out before, but the CD box set is now out. It's been out what since when? Uh, since around March and yeah, yeah. Way, so fairly recently, that, you, you you could blame our fans for that. When the uh, vinyl came out, there was quite a bit of ruckus from some of the audio files. He really wanted the CD version, but the label right. had made it, and they they went okay. There's a demand for it, so right. they've made it, and. Both of them, the vinyl and the CD box, are in their second pressing now. You know, oh. not like a huge pressing like the Rolling Stones or, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a well, big deal to is, me. Yeah, well, and I checked, uh, and, and both of them are available and in stock and ready to go, the CDs and the and the vinyl box. So uh, That's true. But, but Todd's had the CD box set, and I saw that he had it. And I got it. And once I got it, Vanessa, holy crap. This is how box sets should be made. I mean, this should be, I mean, I've got a lot of CD box sets and stuff, but this set is absolutely stunning. Absolutely Definitely stunning. the finest book I've ever seen. The finest book I've ever seen in the box set. It was a team effort. We had a great team working with us. Um, all the way from the writer, Stephen Deusner, to uh, um, Henry Owings, who put uh, the graphics together under the direction of Michael Husky. Um, and Michael is like the Pylon graphics guru, and he actually made a style book for Henry, so Henry would understand the way Pylon liked to do things. And... Uh, you know, for example, no more than three point sizes on one page and so on. Yeah. Um, so he's like the, full tilt graphic designer type of guy. Yeah, Michael Lohesky yeah. is. And uh, so is Henry. Henry's actually, I think he's gotten a Grammy for something in the oh. past. Oh, my. Um, but uh, darn, okay. Uh, he, he's done quite... He said quite a few things like, you know, Hesker do you, and I'm tr trying to remember what I'm actually working with uh, my husband and him right now on a uh, unannounced project for my husband's band. Oh, exciting. Uh, they have a, yeah, they, they just announced a, a live record that'd be coming out on Struggling Bones, which is a subsidiary in New West. And that'd be out in August, but the other records they have are all going to get a reissue on another light bulb. Wow. That's great. 
Holy crap. See, so you heard it here well, first. Well, congratulations. <laughs> I get my credit card ready. Well, I mean, I, all, <laughs> I, mean I was just going to say the whole point of this interview, and I was so taken by the box set that I, and Pylon is such an, an American icon. Maybe not everybody knows. Everybody knows the B-52s and REM. But I'm with Bill Barry on this. I mean, Chomp is like one of my all-time favorite records. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to be all oh, no. <laughs> fanboy well, you know. on you. But well. I think it's one of the great <laughs> records from the you know all any of the Athens bands. I mean Todd probably can agree with me on that. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh but as long as we're talking about New West, New West yes. is so awesome. Not only do they have the box set, but they have this vinyl. This the one, one I have is really cool. It's green. And then Chomp, of course, in red vinyl. And they have both albums on CD and even more important than that, cassettes there you go. See, course, Vanessa, see what I'm dealing with right here? <laughs> and, of course, when you buy the cassette, you get your pencil and your button. And so New West is amazing. They're one of my favorite labels. And for them to have all of this stuff out, I mean, just the box set would have been enough. But uh, <laughs> they're just <laughs> they've, they've fantastic. Been really, they've been very supportive. And uh, actually, Box just finally broke even. Okay. We didn't, we didn't really pass the cost over that much to consumers is very expensive to make. Oh my I God, mean, I'm sure. You know, so, yeah. I mean, you know, look at it. It's a hard pant bound 200 page yeah. book and, and a slip case, but we don't want to like charge 200 bucks for it. We just like cut it to the bare bones and, uh, you know, here, here we are. Yeah. Well, it didn't, it didn't With seem. It. I'm very, uh, it didn't seem to be very expensive. It seemed to be right on the, I mean, it seemed to be a really good deal for what you get. Um, how did uh, you guys come to be associated with New West? Well, I've been working toward this project probably since Randy died because all of our stuff had been out of print and then we were kind of disassociating ourselves from DFA and uh, it took a while to kind of untangle all the business knots, but also gather all of the recordings, you know, back um, to where we could access them and get them, uh, you know, completely uh, restored and remastered. Uh, the guy who's in my band, uh, he plays guitar, the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so love this. Jason E. Smith. <laughs> um, he's a certified auto engineer. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he told me at practice one night, he didn't really know I was doing all this business stuff. But he said, you know, if, if you ever want to reissue Gyrate and Chomp, I'd really like to have a crack at it. And... I just kind of filed that away. And once things kind of got tied up, then um, he had a um, a friend, you know, that he'd worked on the Almond Brothers box set for, um, you know, doing the mastering for that. And um, my, my brain is going dead. But he helped me put together a business plan. And I started approaching labels, and uh, they were only labels I was interested in, and uh, just a handful. And every single one of them was interested, but it came down to the fact, the quality of the product that I saw from New West. They just put out the Glans box set. Uh, they were going to push us to do more than we originally intended, which was to reissue these two albums. And uh, they would let us do everything the way we wanted it to. They didn't have like a set template or a set graphic mm -hmm. artist or whatever. He had to oversee the project. They were willing to give us total freedom. freedom. And uh, Brady Brock, um, he was a pylon fan, uh, came in to be, you know, like... Uh, 
the executive producer of the project. We're very lucky, lucky to get to work with Brady and George uh, Fontaine Sr. was completely on board with letting us do whatever we wanted. And uh, we just tried to stay on budget. And uh, so many people donated things, it was unreal. Otherwise, you'd be looking like at a $500. Of course, some people have to be paid and we did right. pay them, but um, like Terry Allen, for instance, the photographer, he donated a lot of um, photographs. So it, it was just a true pleasure to get to work with the entire team. You know, everybody over in the West is great. Well, one thing that I've noticed about their their stuff is that every release that they put out looks really nice. I mean, it, it they 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 manage to put out you know every every release just just has great artwork and great design and made out of quality materials. And so I just I just love them. And th I think this box is of course the best thing they have. But uh, and th the guy yeah. that did the design is a I mean he really nailed it because I thought Michael did it when I saw it. I was like, well, oh, Michael, Michael did this. <laughs> Michael did do certain parts of it, like the very beginning of the book, all the way up to the white pylon. That's uh, really about the band, and it's also like a tribute to Randy. And yeah. uh, Michael did do those pages, but he oversaw it, and uh, mm -hmm. he brought in some of his own photographs, including a box of them while he was working on it. It fell off a shelf and hit him in the head, and he went, oh. I haven't oh. seen this. These are 40 years <laughs> and, you know, that kind of thing. So Michael was well, just amazing. Yeah. One of my favorite things about the book is that you'll, there'll be text where they'll be talking about a flyer or something and you'll turn the page and there it will be. So that's like, that's, that's makes it so much fun. Cause I grew up in Athens and I saw a lot of that stuff. So not didn't grow up there, but went to school there, but uh, <laughs> it makes it so much fun. <laughs> Todd was there a lot. Let's say that. Well, it's yeah. really funny when uh, we met Michael and I gathered what we had and we got some things from Randy's sons uh, to take in, to have them photographed and scanned at New West. Jason Thrasher came in and set up. We started over at a UGA Special Collections and shot the back cover of the book because mm -hmm. we donated that stuff and they couldn't come off the premises. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then um, <laughs> we went over to the U.S. and we took over this really big room that they have, uh, which has a stage on it. And um, they were just like astounded at the amount of stuff we had. They were like, you kept everything? And it's like, <laughs> well, you know, we were an art project. And part of what we were doing was documenting what we were doing. So, yes, we did keep everything. So, you Y'all didn't see everything that we had, but you got probably the cream of it. I love those design sketches of the of the Chomp album that, that show you know all the all the text and where the pictures will be and everything. It's so much fun to see that stuff. Um, yeah. So tell us, a, <laughs> tell me about the Raz tape about Chris Rasmussen. Yeah. That's an amazing recording. I mean, for for what it is for being a cassette recording with three mics. I mean, he knew what he was doing. It's, yeah, because yeah. the, the sound quality on that is, when I listened to it, I couldn't believe that that was like what it was. It was quite good. And, and didn't you have to go like in, to the, like in the, the hallway to sing or something because the band was so loud? Is that true? Well, they had to separate the vocals out some way. And mm -hmm. it was like, um, we couldn't see each other. So we were just like, kind of like totally working on trust. Um, Chris was actually out in the hall with me. That's where the tape deck was. Um, the mic got, uh, they mic one of the mics to the drums. The other mic was shared between the bass and the guitar. And then I got the third one. And it was just kind of like, one, two, three, let's go. And uh, <laughs> that's- But know, it's very listenable. One, I mean, it, it it's very listenable. It, the sound quality, I'm really surprised by it. And yeah, course, I would have, it's, it's I would have accepted that as wonderful. a document, even if it wasn't as good, you know. If, right. if it, but it it is good. 
Yeah, there's a couple of those songs that are as good as our early studio recordings, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, the, I'm thinking the human body, that kind of struck me. I was just like, right on it, you know, I think. And the fact that uh, we, I don't know, the guys were so good. I mean, they really were. Curtis is one of the best drummers in the world. Randy, everybody was like, how does he get all of that out of the guitar? I mean, Randy had I was going to bring that up. Um, you know, some <laughs> bands... <laughs> some bands have groupies we had people who followed us because of randy and i know once i was off the stage you know during an instrumental watching them and there were two guys there standing there talking to each other and one of them was like i don't know what he's doing it doesn't look that hard but i, I just don't understand <laughs> you know <Right. laughs> They didn't know that he used an alternate tuning, uh, but he also, it wasn't uh, all about making actual notes. It was about making mm -hmm. the sounds, you know, to come out of it. And because he started as a drummer, uh, he did all these percussive things to his strings and to the guitar itself. So, you know, making overtones and bending it toward the amp and whatnot. And then Michael was a great bassist, uh, just complete natural, you know. I don't know what I'm very lucky to have fallen in with those guys. I was, probably I was gonna the say, weekend, but weakest link. <laughs> but Randy's guitar playing for someone who wasn't all that experienced. But if you listen to all those recordings, I mean, it was just it's like capturing lightning in a bottle. It was the four of you that created this magic. I mean, Bill Barry was totally on with his statement. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I don't, him, I'm not trying to be a big fanboy here, but he was totally right. The combination well, of you sweet. four. What, no, he was totally <laughs> right. The combination of you four together was magical. I'm just saying. Yeah. And, and, and the timing was right because for somebody like yes. me, I was hearing Pylon at the same time I was discovering Robert Fripp. I was discovering Devo. And so all of that happened at the same time. And for me, Randy was a giant because he, I thought he was as, as great as the rest of the really innovative guitarists that were coming around, around that 79, 80 time. And uh, I man, agree. I'm lucky. I'm so lucky had a, grown up then. <laughs> he had a very unique tone. Yeah. And so did Michael. And the combination between both of them and you, I'm not, I mean, everybody, but they, you were very unique at the time. There was nothing quite like that. I must say you were trailblazers, even though you might not have thought you were, but I'm just saying, throwing it well, out there. You know, Bob, I, the, at first, you know, there were a lot of people just didn't know what to make out of us. They just thought we were weird or whatever, but, you know, you, you sound like a bunch of our students, that kind of thing. <laughs> Well, but, maybe uh, that's all it I takes. Mean, but then it turned into this thing. Like people, especially in Athens, started to get us. Uh, they would dance like crazy. And uh, the B-52s saw us pretty early on. And they said, you got to come to New York. I mean, I, I don't think it was maybe the third or fourth show we played. I mean, we're very, very lucky. And uh, what about what Bill said? A few years ago, I was at a party, and he was too, and uh, I just passed him in the hall, and I said, Bill, I bet you're tired of saying your quote about Pylon. <laughs> and he, it's legendary. He said, I'll I give mean, it that. I, I, <laughs> he said, I meant every word. <laughs> I mean, what a guy. All those REM guys and the B-52s, every one of them. And so, so it started with Michael and Randy, and then uh, Curtis was their upstairs neighbor. Do I have that right? Is that what happened? And he That's came down story. and said, "Hey, yeah, let me. Uh, maybe I can help you guys out." <laughs> and I love the story about your uh, your audition, if you don't mind telling it. Well, um, I uh, I was still hanging around Athens because my first husband hadn't graduated from college yet, and. Uh, that was Jimmy Ellison. He was later in the band, The Side Effects. And uh, 
So I had uh, uh, two jobs, one at DuPont on the weekends, and during the week I got another one uh, working at JCPenney in the catalog department, and one day I was back in there on the phones, and uh, the gr a girl on the front counter uh, put her head around, and she, she said, hey, there's this really cute guy out here who wants to talk to you. And I was still on the phone and I looked out, I went, oh, that's Randy, you know. Um, he was a friend of mine from art school. And so uh, I wasn't sure what was up, but uh, I went out and he invited me to come audition to the band, this band he had. And uh, um, I didn't know that they'd already auditioned like three guys, but none of them worked out. I mean, for instance, one guy, he came in and already had songs that he'd written and he wanted to steer the band in this direction, but they kind of wanted to start from scratch and make it their own thing. And so uh, Randy said, well, how about Vanessa? Um, she's a good friend of ours. Uh, we'd had art classes together. They liked me a lot and uh, liked the way I dressed and that kind of thing. And so, uh, um, they said, come on by tonight and we'll talk about it some more. So I said, okay. So it was Valentine's Day, 1979, and they'd been learning how to play and practicing and made up, made up some songs since like fall of 78. Um, anyway, they had placed before me this orange vinyl notebook on a music stand they had the lyrics all neatly typed up inside for, I don't know, maybe seven or eight songs. And uh, uh, they played a song and then I would try to do something with what they put in front of me. And then um, at, the, at that point, I was going, you know, these, they weren't really thinking about the meter of the lyrics compared to the music. These don't really fit. But I'm going to try to make them fit. So I did. I would extend some words and make some shorter, you know, whatnot. And uh, so at the end of the uh, <clears throat> the session or audition or whatever the heck that was, um, I was, they were like, well, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll call you tomorrow. And uh, I was like, so that's it, huh? Okay. Well, the next day, Randy did call me up and uh, he said, okay, you're in. Uh, what I want to explain to you is this is an art project and we have as our goal that we're going to go to New York, play at a club, get written up at New York Rocker, and then break up. And uh, I thought, you know, this isn't going to take a whole lot of time out of my life. I mean... Yeah, let's do this. And I completely understood that because an art project, it always has some kind of goal. Either you're going to perform it, you know, do a performance art piece, or mm -hmm. you're going to display it and invite people to look at it or not look at it, you know, um, et cetera. So I completely understood that, and I thought it sounded like a lot of fun. I mean, all I had to do at that point was work. So anyway... Um, we played our first show uh, in front of people just a few weeks later. Um, I'd auditioned on uh, February the 14th, 1979, which was, uh, you know, not too many months after that actually started back in the fall of 78. And then we played our first show in front of people above Chapter 3 Records on um, March 9th, 1979. And uh, they were like, sure, you can play here. you got to clean it, though. And, I mean, that place is full of pitch and dust and all kinds of crap was up there. So we cleaned it up and we set it up with, um, you know, like a, a screen to project things on and has some neon and... I had a little lighted stand and I got a referee shirt to wear, um, that kind of thing, you know, to go with my whistle. And so uh, we played and people just stood there and stared at us. I mean, you got to realize this town had just sent the B-52s 
off and they were going into orbit. We were not like B-52s. We were probably closer to like a jet aircraft engine or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and then we played uh, not too long after that, we played again actually up in uh, <clears throat> Curtis's uh, loft, which they called the 40 watt club because uh, he and his friend Bill Tabor used to lay on a mattress up there and smoke pot or something. And Bill said, hey, this is our 40 watt club because it was a bulb hanging from the ceiling by a single wire. It was like the light source. And uh, so we played up there and uh, it was kind of something more the same. And then, um, uh, then we played this house out in the country, which that had an art show out at before out in Oglethorpe County. You know where T Oglethorpe County is, Todd? I do. Absolutely. Well, back then it was deep country compared yes. to Athens. Yeah. Fields, you know, green stuff. Um, so we played in this old house that had giant ceilings and big windows and, um, it, the music was making it like a speaker box. The wind was just rushing in and out. And then about yeah. then the beef two showed up and they were like, what? <laughs> and they were like, holy shit. And they all started dancing like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and after we played, they said, you've got to come to New York. So they had a friend, Robert Molnar. He was the door guy at a, the med club and he knew everybody so he helped us get booked into hurrah yeah uh, at new york which the b-52s has sold out i mean people were lined up around the block to get in there and so of course anything they said was good to them and so we got offers a few people to open for and we we're gonna like nah no and i mean <coughs> thinking about it who were we? We were nobody to say, oh, we don't want to open for that band. No, <laughs> no thanks. And then finally they said, what about the Gang of Four? They're coming over. And we were like, yeah, we love them. We had that first single that had Armalite Rifle on one side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it had three songs on it. Anyway, it was uh, a single we played at parties and we loved them. We're like, yeah, we'll open for them. Um, so on the basis of that, uh, our friend Vic Varney helped us get a few other shows booked. Vic Varney, um, yeah. He was with the Method Actors later on. But he That's was right. in a band called the Tone Tones that we actually opened for at our first show. Or second show. Our first show. Maybe we played with them at both shows. Anyway... <laughs> I'm going fessy here right now, but it doesn't matter. You're you know. fine. You're fine. You just go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, um, on the basis of that, he was calling clubs going, would you like to book this new band from Athens, Georgia? Uh, who were opening for the Gang of Four in New York. And uh, so he got us a date in Philadelphia and in Boston uh, like that. The club in uh Philadelphia <clears throat> turned out that was our first show out of town and we got there, we played and it was kind of like, eh, and, uh, we were waiting around and it's like, where is the gang of four? And, uh, they managed to get a hold of the club. And back then this club, the way you call the club is to call the pay phone. Uh -huh. So the guy who <laughs> owned the club was, you know, hanging around the pay phone waiting for somebody to call him. Turned out they'd broken down in the Holland Tunnel, their truck had, and they're like, we're on our way. We're, we're going to be there. We're going to come. But, you know, of course, it was Holland Tunnel. It took a little while. In the meantime, the <clears throat> audience was getting very restless. I mean, it was sold out. And then people piling in the street. Um, it was like a near riot situation, the way Curtis describes it. <clears throat> I don't remember that, but I remember it being, you know, very serious punks there because it's the first time I ever had somebody slam dance to me. And not, they, they knocked me 
flat on my ass. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? He said, it's a new dance called the West Coast Shove. I was like, I don't like it. <laughs> you can keep it. So that's what it was called. I didn't know what it really was called. <laughs> well, that's what they were calling it anyway. And uh, we got a, um, finally, you know, the gang of four, uh, you know, they were like, we're really on our way. And uh, the club guy, he turned to us and he said, would you please play another set? You know, because he was just trying to keep the situation under control. And it says, we already played everything we know. He said, play it again. <laughs> and so we did. And the second time we got a better reception. And about the time we finished, the Gang of Four just blew into the club, slammed down a big bottle of liquor. I think it was Rebel Yell backstage on the table. And they immediately, you know, just started setting things up, you know, like, me, p p plugging in cans so they could get their trademark lighting and uh, Hugo came over to Curtis and said hey uh, is it okay if I play your drums and Curtis was like he had the set that he would put together basically for free that was a bunch of crap and he said yeah <laughs> sure go ahead <laughs> yeah, oh, you can't boy. hurt you can't hurt this stuff and so uh they played, and that is literally the best show I've ever seen by anybody anywhere. <laughs> I was going to say, I bet that kit sounded great anyway. <laughs> it sure did. And they were just amazing. I mean, I guess being uh, locked down in a tunnel for three hours will you know, give you a lot of pent-up frustration. You've got to get out. So uh, that, that was good. And so we were kind of already starting to be buddies with them, and then the next show we played was with them in New York City. And he go came over to Curtis and he said, <clears throat> there's not a lot of room on the stage or backstage. Is it okay if you play my drum set? And uh, Curtis looked over and it was like a brand new, you know, kit, like some very expensive set of drums. And he said, hell yeah, you know. <laughs> and they became really good friends. And <laughs> we had a really good show and uh, it was sold out and uh, that was, you know, how we got started, you know. So we did get written up for that show, but it was not the New York rocker. It was uh, <clears throat> Interview Magazine. Oh, so. Andy Warhol, right? Yeah, yeah, Andy Warhol's magazine. Well, that's fine. You can take that. That's okay. Well, it's like at that point in time, it was like somebody pointed out, it's like you wanted to be in um, like uh, the local magazine mm -hmm. and you ended up in like U.S. News and World Report. You know, that's what somebody said to me. And I went, oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. Because they had international distribution as a fashion art magazine. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that is so cool. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you about a uh, pylon reenactment society. I had yeah. heard that uh, this is your uh, Pat messenger and cliff notes single. Um, I heard that you guys had a uh, enough material for an album ready and it kind of got, Put on hold because of the pandemic is there any uh you guys thinking about starting that back up yes we've already recorded a few back in december okay. and uh we've got a uh session schedule for july so we're getting closer okay you know to it you know we were all on lockdown right so we're having you know since this point in time two members have had to move on to their own projects of what they were doing uh, but we are back to our original drummer, okay, uh, he, um, Gregory, and uh, he, uh, you know, has been playing with Jason and Kay on and off for years. Mm -hmm. You know, back with their project Casper and the Cookies. Yeah. Okay. So, so cool. we've we've got incoming. You know, uh, okay. we've recorded some of them too. You know. I think we were pretty good. I uh, I was in there singing and I wanted a beer and 
David Barbie went and got it for me himself, you know. <laughs> really? That's kind of a sign that I was saying good that day. Yeah. I I'd say that's <laughs> a good so. sign. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully that comes out soon because I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I, I I am too. I I love the single and I love part time punks. I have I don't have a physical copy to hold that because I uh, bought the I bought the download on uh, Bandcamp, but yeah, I can't wait for more Pylon Reenactment Society material. So I wanted to talk real quick, Vanessa, about the times that I've seen Pylon five times. And um, the first time was in 1982 at the Strand Cabaret in Marietta. Oh my and gosh. I, I was in high school. I was a senior in high school. And my, my memories of it are pretty sketchy because it was all a very exciting time. And I'm getting older and you know what happens when you... <laughs> You might have. You, you, are you saying you might have been drunk? No, no. Actually, I, 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 was, I was a, oh, I was a, a Puritan, geeky teetotaler. But, uh, but yeah, I just uh, it, it, it was so long ago. I saw I saw you guys and I saw Love Tractor there, and both of them were just uh, pivotal experiences for me. But I, I, I don't like. I can't remember like what the set list was or anything like that. But I know I was there. I remember being there. And the next time I saw you was 1989 at the Athens Spring Music Fest at the fairgrounds. And and Grant, do you, I, there was a photo that I found online. Do you do you uh, have that handy? Uh, I think this. Yeah, is that. that one. I don't know whether that's this in one? Atlanta. Yeah, that's the one. I don't know whether that's in Atlanta close to that date or whether that's at the fairgrounds date. But I remember that show so well and i i, I want to talk about the other three times i saw you and then we'll go back to that show because that show was was just really important to me but in 89 i saw you at the fox op open for rem at the benefit show that they had there and uh and then in 2007 i saw pylon at the 40 watt club and we do have some photos that i took from there um... if uh sorry grant i'm going kind of fast <laughs> no 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 todd you're fine i'm just gonna pop some Images okay, up. so so th those photos right there are from the last time I saw Pylon, which is in Winston Salem. Okay, there you go. I'm just gonna go that's, through them. And you, Todd, you talk about them. That's from 2008. That's the same. Uh, yeah. Where uh, Mitch Easter's gravel truck opened for you guys. There's me and Vanessa a long time ago. Well, not that long ago. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Look, I'm see, wearing Vanessa? a hat. Uh huh. Well, of course. There's you another photo with you without the hat. You said, "Let me try it without the hat." But I liked the hat one better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is and, um, this is the 40 watt oh. from 2007. But Vanessa, I was going to no, say, you go back if, to that. if you've noticed, Todd doesn't have gray hair here. I'm just going to yes. say that. <laughs> if you've noticed. I'm also a little trimmer. <laughs> this yeah, is the we, this one. Yeah. This one. This is the 40 watt. This is in 2007. And... Uh, yeah. And again, all of these times, especially 2007 and 2008, I was just like, this is just, this is bonus pylon. I'm so happy to be seeing them again. It really meant a lot to us to, that you guys did this third go around. It really did. But I want to tell the Athens Fairground story that, real quick. So Athens Fairground, 1989, <laughs> in the middle of a field, I'm probably 50, 60 feet away from the, the, the front of the stage. And so there's some space around me and I'm dancing and I'm not much of a dancer. But I'm dancing like crazy, and I look up at the sky, at the sky, and I see the stars, and I, I thought to myself, remember this, because I don't know if I'm going to experience anything this great again. I just thought it was just absolutely magical. It was one of the best nights of my life, and so I just wanted to, to tell that story so that you could could know that how much it meant to us. The two times that Pylon reunited, it brought so many people so much joy. And so thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. That's a beautiful story. That's beautiful. Yeah. And yes. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to come back or do box or these reissues, except we have people like you that remember us so fondly, you know, the stalwart fans who've been there all along. Uh, I mean, every time we've reunited, we've gotten a new generation of fans or we put out something, a new generation of fans that have come along. I mean, we Pylon Reenactment Society, when we play, it's like a true all ages show. Um, yeah. 
it's like so many young girls. I, they love seeing me and Kay up there. And yeah. then um, it's like, it's, it's, you know, I can't believe I'm still doing this. <laughs> well, I, well, Vanessa, I'm glad you are doing it. So, and and there Don't is stop. a there is a clip of um of uh you guys uh doing uh stop it at a at a at a I don't I don't I can't remember where it is but it's in Atlanta. There's a clip on on YouTube and it's one of my most watched clips. It's just absolutely magical and the energy in that room is just spectacular. So I'm hoping that I'll be get to 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 see you guys a couple of times. But it's not lost on me how lucky i am to have been in athens during that time it's it's not lost on me at all but uh but yeah we're looking forward to uh pylon reenactment society so i wanted to do one extra thing one of the things that i loved about the box set is how there's discussions about the lyrics and how some of the lyrics came about and uh i wanted to ask you vanessa did you write most of the lyrics or were some of them already written like the stuff on gyrate well some of the ones on gyrate i'm going to pull the album out and uh that's that was a book that came crashing down there uh that you just heard <laughs> but okay. uh since you can't see what's going on all right i'm pulling out my copy of gyrate and i will tell you you know which ones I wrote, uh, Michael wrote volume, but I changed some of the lyrics. Okay. Feast of my heart. I wrote the lyrics with a friend of mine, uh, Craig Woodall. He was a neighbor. And what we did is, you know, it was like a rainy day afternoon thing. We opened up Shakespeare at random, put our finger down on, a section of Shakespeare and we translated it into modern slang. He would take one line. I would take the next. So it's from <laughs> Titus Adronicus, um, act two, scene two. Precaution. Michael wrote those lyrics. Weather okay. radio doesn't have any human body. Michael wrote those read a book. I wrote those driving school. Um, Michael wrote those, Gravity, I wrote those, uh, Danger, Michael wrote those, Working is No Problem, I wrote those, and then Stop It, Michael wrote those. Okay, all right. So it's about half and half on that record. And yeah, then, and, um, you know, if you wouldn't look that up, you, it, it's not totally obvious that there's so much of a difference between what you wrote and what Michael wrote, at least not to me. They all yeah, seem to be yeah. so consistent. My favorite is uh, is precaution. Precaution, I absolutely love. Oh yeah, <laughs> out in the sun, but I can see. I had on my sunglasses. I just absolutely love that. <laughs> Me too, and it's fun, <laughs> fun to sing. And, oh, I bet. Uh, <laughs> now I'm looking at uh, Chomp. And, okay. Uh, K and is then, my favorite. Yeah. Now I co-wrote that one with Michael using a Scrabble game. It was so funny to listen to that for the first time and think, are they talking about a Scrabble game? <laughs> and and yes, it turns out you were. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We would take a alternate, uh, like we'd end up with the word and we'd have to make up a line that went with that word. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wrote, beep, I wrote, uh, crazy, I wrote, M train, I wrote, bus, I wrote. No clocks, I wrote. Reptiles, I wrote. Spider, I wrote. Gyrate, I wrote. And altitude, I wrote. I wrote okay. all of those. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so, Vanessa, out of your catalog, I'm just curious. Is there a certain album that you consider maybe your the best album that you guys produced? Or is there a certain session or a certain... Is there a certain time that you, you know, find precious to you or... Well, it I, all mean, I, I, I mean, I I think Chomp is a, I think Chomp is a great record. That's my favorite. Mine too. But I'm just I'm well, just curious. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with y'all in that I think overall <laughs> that Chomp is the best record. But the process of making that record was a very long drawn out process because they were we brought in a producer and an engineer who 
were in the DB, so they had their own project, and that we were on the road a lot. So getting all of our schedules together was, uh, it wasn't a nightmare, but it was a challenge. And so um, it took a long time. And uh, I, I like Gyrate, which was recorded in mix and a matter of, a, you know, three or four days. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the dry rate experience was probably more fun in a way, but I think the results were definitely better on Chomp. How was it working with Mitch Easter on that? Oh, well, he was, you know, it was his studio and, uh, he's such a nice guy. And, uh, um, he was just all about trying to get us, you know, whatever we needed. Um, Chris brought in something called a noise gate, which we hadn't seen before. And, uh, it was triggered sounds like, uh, might be triggered from the bass drum or something off the guitar or in the room or whatever. Uh, so that was interesting to work with. Um, and that's what Randy wanted. That's why we moved from, uh, Bruce Baxter because Bruce Baxter, he didn't really produce. He was a great engineer, great mixer. Um, but uh, um, we wanted somebody outside of ourselves to, you know, give us some ideas and, right. you know, really produce it. And um, uh, Chris Damien was great. He's great to work with. I mm -hmm. mean, I have read a, a thing he wrote about that process. It kind of made it sound like we were a bunch of idiots, but. <laughs> well, you don't sound like a bunch of idiots on the record. I'll give you that. But I, I the, reason I, the reason I brought up Mitch is that Todd and I just did a show on Let's Active where we looked at the Let's Active catalog. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Great guy. He, he, uh, he engineered it along with uh, Gene Holder, and um, mm -hmm. he was there to offer advice and help set up. And I love Mitch's mom; she was so great. <laughs> Did you record that at the drive-in? I'm trying to yes at the drive-in, wouldn't it? It was in his parents' studio. I mean, yeah. his parents' garage that he turned into a studio. So when we were there in the winter, it was like if it was zero outside, it was zero in that studio. Um, <laughs> oh my god! You know, so oh, it was crazy. That is so great. <laughs> well, Vanessa, yeah. we really appreciate you talking to us tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to the camera. I must have broke it, you know, or something, you know. But we'll put up a pretty picture of you in that spot. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about it. I'll handle that in, in post. Yeah, don't, don't <laughs> take take me from like the previous thing here if I like stuck my finger in my nose or something. <laughs> yeah, that's all I ask. I'm, we I'm won't not, do that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not terribly vain, you know. Just like I know I'm 66. Just gotta go with the flow. I'm right behind you. <laughs> all right, nipping at my heels. <laughs> Well, we're, you know, it beats the alternative is all it I does. gotta say. It does. <laughs> it's but, been a pleasure, Grant. Well, you know, Vanessa, I love this stuff and I love this, the whole interview process. And I think your body of work speaks for itself. I mean. Well, then why did you have me on? Just kidding. Because <laughs> you're top notch. <laughs> She's here all week. <laughs> well, I do have something I want to add, but I'll wait till we hit the end of the broadcast and I'll follow up then. Oh, okay. Uh, but, it's not sad. Yeah, sorry. No, I just want to run something by it. I don't know. Todd doesn't even know what I'm going to need saying. <laughs> but I okay. want to thank Vanessa for coming on and talking about the pylon catalog. There was so much that we could have hit that we didn't get get a chance to. But it's been a pleasure, and I I thank you, Vanessa, for coming on and talking with Todd and I. It's just absolutely – I really don't know what to say. I'm just all giddy, like a little well, girl. Oh, oh, or a little boy. Hey, you know, this has been a lot of fun. I mean, you know, this just takes me out of my everyday, you know, thing well, and – Good. I, I enjoy talking to people. I miss my job Good. as a nurse because I love talking to people, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. 
that's what I like. So this has been a lot of fun for me. Thank you for having me. So Todd, do you have anything to add before we, uh, no, just everything you said. This has been, really been a pleasure. And uh, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to see Pylon in so many incarnations and looking forward to seeing uh, Pylon Reenactment Re Society. And one more reminder, buy the box. It's available at New West Records website. Yeah. In stock. And, and the vinyl your... is readily available too, so get it. Yep. And that's what this whole pro show is about, to get the word out and reintroduce pylon because like i like well obviously you know todd is a big fanboy. we we've seen that but we love the band and we just want to get the word out there i know we're a little late to the party but what like i told you vanessa once i heard this box set and looked at the quality of it i'm just telling you you guys did it right i'm just going to leave it at that Thank you so much. It was a team effort and everybody on the team was great. All right. Well, we'll see you, Vanessa. Hang on real quick because I want to run something by you. And Todd, don't leave yet. All right. Good okay. night, everybody, and enjoy the episode. Good night.